Let's open our Bibles tonight to Philippians chapter 1. We want to get started. We also have communion tonight. We want to have some time to spend contemplating God's great sacrifice for us. Chapter 1, verse 27. We're going to finish the chapter 1 tonight. Paul, as you remember, was under house arrest in Rome when he wrote this letter to the first church planted in Europe that he was involved with. Um, you can find all of the information for that in Acts 15 and 16. And Paul was awaiting a verdict from Nero who had heard his case, and there was only two possible outcomes. You die or you live. And yet Paul, of all things, chose this first of four letters to write about joy. And we've gone over that. We've looked at the four chapters and saw that Paul wants to write to us about how we can keep joy, though we are faced with difficult circumstances, chapter 1, difficult people in chapter 2, difficult things in chapter 3, the want for them. And in chapter 4, he addresses all about worry. Well, we have looked at verses 1 through 11 and saw about the, the joy that, that is available for fellowship amongst the saints. Paul was so glad that they were standing with him, though he had suffered so much. And then last time, from verse 12 down through verse 26, the joy that is born when the fruit comes, even though the life is difficult to live. And Paul just thought it was worth it. Didn't matter what we were going through. If, if the Lord is glorified, then he's just fine with it. In fact, Paul said he believed God had shown him, verse 19, I think verse 25 as well, that God had shown him that he might be released from jail, though he couldn't be sure. But tonight at the last part of chapter 1, verses 27 through 30, Paul said, look, whether I come to see you again, or I just get to hear about you, I, I want to be sure that, that you are standing fast in your faith, and that you're moving forward because the world is watching us, and they need to be saved. So Paul, as an optimistic guy on death row, says to the church at Philippi, who were suffering really the same things he were, from the same kind of folks, you know, you as a church need to be able to stand tall and make a difference in your life. I read a story the other day from a missionary who said that he was in the field years ago in the jungle when he found himself surrounded by cannibals. And it kind of scared him. Makes sense. But he said there was one guy amongst the group that was just staring at him intently. He wouldn't take his eyes off of him. and It kind of creeped him out. Wherever he moved, he would just look at him. And he finally couldn't take it anymore. And he said to the guy, look, why are you staring like that at me? He said, I am the tribe's food inspector. <laughs> well, I think sometimes you probably feel that way too, right? The world tends to scrutinize believers and they look at you intently, and they study to find out what makes you tick. And indeed, they are watching. The world doesn't want solid, committed believers. They would rather you just mess up constantly so they can discredit you and the message that you bring. Now, I know that there are some Christians who do some pretty foolish things in the name of the Lord, and, and they kind of embarrass all of us. But there's also a tremendous growing intolerance to the gospel in the world. I mean, more so than maybe we've seen in our lifetime, there is this, this hatred for Christians. And Paul had that too. Wherever Paul went, and wherever Paul shared, it was always, he was followed by the haters who opposed him, who, who, who abused him, they beat him, they imprisoned him. It wasn't really much different. In fact, it was much worse even than it is today. But even in this letter, Paul, who so loved this church, wanted to be sure that these saints, as hard as things were, would make a difference. So he ends chapter 1 in talking about the joy that you can have despite the circumstance by challenging him to rise up above it. Mark Twain years ago, when he was asked about the Bible, said it wasn't the parts that he didn't understand that bothered him, it was the parts that did. Well, these few verses tonight are not hard to understand, but they are challenging to apply. Uh, we are... Um, called by the Lord, gifted by the Lord. I'll put it this way. You are privileged by the Lord to suffer for his name's sake. Makes no sense unless you're a believer. Jesus said, if the world hates you, because it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, then you would be loved by the world. He went on to say, if all men speak well of you, there's a problem. Because the gospel that you bring doesn't allow for that. There are really only two ways you can escape persecution as a Christian, and you're seeing it more and more. One is, you can die, pretty much ends all persecution. But the second one is you can do absolutely nothing. Just kind of blend into the woodwork and, 
and just, you know, don't make too much noise. But you know what the world needs? It needs some believers who are willing to stand up and be counted. To say, this is the gospel. This is what God tells us. And to pay the price and to take the flack and to suffer, if need be, for the sake of the Lord who so suffered for us. If you stand up, you will pay up. But you will also grow up. Really no other way around it. So I'd like to give you just tonight four qualities in these few verses here towards the end of the chapter um, that Paul gives to us that distinguish the fruitfulness of the church in the life of the world who so opposes them, beginning in verse 27 with the word, or it doesn't, it's not in the word, but it, it implies that the word consistency. Paul says to the church at Philippi, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs. He starts by saying to them, look, you've got to live in the world that hates God proudly as God's people. While you pray and wait for me with hope, walk with Jesus faithfully in full view of the world. Paul had written last time when we were studying that the suffering he had faced to him was worth it. Do you remember that? He said it was worth it to me because it has led, let the word of God go to places it might never have otherwise gone into the dungeons of Rome, among the prison guard, into the palaces of Nero. And he said, you know, even some of the church is now much more fired up than it used to be. This is good. <laughs> What's good? That I'm on death row, falsely accused. Other believers had been made more bold in their faith. And Paul wanted that outcome for the church at Philippi to be worth it as well. Not to just suffer and then be stumbled or separated when things got difficult, but to stand up. Paul said to Timothy in the last letter that he would ever write, everyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Really no way around it. If you want to ease the pain, just do nothing. But if you're willing to pay the price, God can do great things through your life. I don't mean go out and start trouble. I just mean go out and stand up for him with kindness and mercy and grace. The word conduct here in Greek is the word for politics or police or polite. It comes from the word citizenship or political affiliation. So Paul literally says this to this young church. Look, um, act like God's people or live up to the fact that you are citizens of his kingdom. Back in chapter 1, I think verse 6, wasn't it? No, it wasn't even verse 6, it was verse 1, the second part. Paul talked about them having dual citizenship, right? They were in Christ, but they were in Philippi. You're tonight in Christ, but you're sitting in Whittier. So, you know, they were Romans, if you will, the Philippians, who had all of the privilege of being a Roman colony. It, means, it meant so much to them. And yet, what Paul will say in chapter 3, verse 20, is they are heavenly citizens as well. So Paul was concerned that in the midst of it getting harder, that some of these saints of God would stop conducting themselves as God's citizens. They would be careful to obey Roman law because attached to that could be great consequence. But what they shouldn't forget is that serving the Lord also has great consequence. And God has rules too that we need to follow. And, and you can relate to it, I think, today as a Christian. You know, with increasing difficulty, you have to face a world and speak up for Jesus. It was easier in the 60s, I must tell you. And in the 70s, it was far easier. It was, it was a movement. <laughs> now they like to move you. So an important aspect or asset in reaching the lost is not just a stirring sermon, but a steadfast life in the face of suffering and setback. And Paul says to them, you, your conduct's got to be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we can shine under those circumstances, right? It is worth remembering, I think, that much of the world's understanding of the gospel and of the church is you. They don't read their Bibles. They don't really take a class. They're not showing up at church to, be, to, may, but to pay much attention. They form their opinions about God from the Christian, from you and from me. Everyone's happy when things go well. Where you stand out is that you trust the Lord with joy when things do not go well. When things are uh, opposing you, when you are, because of your faith in Christ, unique God's in charge. He handles it. He works all things together for good. That makes news 
that shows. There's an old rhyme that says, you're writing a gospel, a chapter, a day, by the deeds that you do and the words that you say, men will read what you write, whether faithful or true. Now, just what is the gospel according to you? Well, that's exactly how the world begins to look at us. Paul, when he, he wrote to the Corinthians, that 2 Corinthians 3 letter, said, you know, we have the, the word of God written in our hearts. We are the epistles that are clearly read of all men. So the world gets a lot of their opinions about God from us. And like I said, when things are going fine, nobody has a problem. But the best sermon that you'll ever preach to the lost is being able to have them see Jesus in you at all times. Paul said, or, or, or the Lord said there in Luke chap, uh, Acts chapter 1, uh, you shall be my witnesses. So live your lives worthy of the gospel. By the way, the word worthy is, is a great word. It means to weigh the same. Literally what it means. And it came to be used... To say, you know, uh, in a manner he's worthy of his pay or he's worth his pay. But we would say that our lifestyles have to weigh as much as what we say. In other words, there should be equal weight. You know, if a veteran IRS auditor is arrested for income tax evasion, that's not a consistent life. His profession and his practices are different. And Paul says to the, to the Philippians, Make sure that what you say and what you do weigh the same. Weigh the same. Jesse James was baptized at the Kearney Baptist Church as a believer the same day he robbed a bank and killed a guy. Not real consistent, right? There's no balance there, if you will. When John was in his 90s, and he was really good at calling out people to, to, to weigh the same, he said in 1 John chapter 1, if we say we have fellowship with God, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying. We don't practice the truth. There's an imbalance, right? In chapter 2, verse 4, he said, he who says, I know him, but yet won't keep his commandments, he's a liar. The truth is not in him. He doesn't practice the truth. It's a terrific claim. I know the Lord, but there's no practice to substantiate it. And John was a master of calling into question walks that didn't seem to be worthy of their claims. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, He who says that he abides in him ought also himself to walk, even as he walked. That's worthy. Worthy means to say the same. Right? The things that I claim are also the things that I do. Look, there's something wrong with 80% of Americans claiming to be Christians. It's inconsistent with what I see. I'm sure it's inconsistent with what you see. It's an imbalance. It, it, there's no worthiness there. Last year, the Barna Group did a research and said 45% of Americans claimed they were born-again Christians. 45%, really? The country doesn't reflect that. <laughs> the scales are not equally balanced. But what does Paul say? We should live in such a way that our lives balance the scales. We are worthy of the good news of Jesus. The message and the messenger's life should weigh the same. And our lives have to bear evidence that the good news has first touched us. So you have to ask yourself, has it touched you? What has the gospel done to you? And what do, you, what do people think of when they hear you speak, when they see you act? Is it good news or bad news? Now, I know some Christians who say they're saved anyway. I don't know. But I know some folks who never seem to have any good news. They are sour and legalistic and hateful and selfish. There has to be some consistency between your conduct and your belief system for it to be worthy to be worthy in the manner of, to weigh the same. I, I remember reading years ago that someone had asked Gandhi what was the greatest hindrance to Christian missionaries in India, and he, without batting an eye, said, Christians. And that's horrible, isn't it? So look, we're Christians living in a hostile world, and we're encouraged to live in ways that bring notice to the message of God's love and to their claims of faith in him. There has to be a balance, if you will. Uh, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, when he gets to the application part, he, he says to them, Look, as a prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you, walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. He said to the Colossians in chapter 1, verse 10, Walk worthy of the Lord, being fully pleasing to him and fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, the second point is equally important besides this first point, and this first point is there has to be a consistency in your life. The second point is 
There needs to be a unity amongst the saints. Notice what Paul says at the end of verse 27. That I may hear of your affairs, and then he says this, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Consistency, walk worthy, let your, let your, your, your citizenship be worthy and weight to the gospel of the good news of Jesus. Let it show. Second of all, stand fast in one spirit with one mind. The word stand fast, steko, is a word that means persist in or persevere or be tenacious. Make sure that while you're living in the world, first of all, that you're consistent. Second of all, that together you stand tenaciously in one spirit with one mind striving together for one purpose. Paul says to the Philippian saints, you got to fight this fight together. You're going to need some help because the opposition just will take you down and tear you up. If you're not in the body, man, you're going to feel like you're out altogether. And that's certainly one of Satan's plans. You know, the Bible talks about us being called to be the body of Christ. It's a beautiful picture used a lot. Many parts, one body. Holy Spirit's like the nervous system, right? He runs down from the head, Christ, to every part to say, you do this and you get over there, but it's all one body. And the idea is that the body, if it's doing the right things, should be smoothly functioning and everybody should contribute while the world is watching. But what do they often see? They see a, a dysfunctional, infighting, spastic group of people who are more interested in defeating each other than reaching the lost. It is a difficult proposition, but the more pressure that becomes obvious, either people are going to run together or they're going to get destroyed. It is difficult oftentimes to get local churches to work together. Everyone has an agenda. Everyone has a plan. Paul says to the Philippians, strive together. He doesn't say strive with one another. Our, our, our strength in large part is due to the fact that we're a body, we're a people. When Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 4, he said, you know, one might be overpowered by another, and two might be able to withstand him, but a threefold, of course, not easily broken. There's something good to be in a group, isn't there? There's safety in numbers, if you will. You and me and Jesus, we're going to be all right. Well, Paul uses the word striving together. It's just one word in Greek. It is two components, though. It's the word soon, which is the word for with, and it is the word for athletics. In fact, Paul uses this word soon. It's a preposition 16 different times in this book because soon means to do it with one another. And he uses it a lot. You know, if you think about it, much of athletics are team sports. There's some individual sports like golf where you're just kind of on your own. Hard to blame anyone else, and then you start blaming the crowd for making too much noise. Shh, I'm trying to putt over here, you know. Okay, yeah, it was my fault. You're just a lousy putter, maybe, but shh. Most, most sports are team sports. And the difficulty is when you have a glory hound on a team sport, right? Where he gets all the throws, he wants all the play, he's involved with all the action, doesn't depend on anyone else, knocks people over to get to the ball. That's difficult when the rest of the team is forgotten. John wrote his third John letter about a fellow named Diotrephes, and he said to you, I'm writing to you about Diotrephes. He loves to have the preeminence in everything, and he won't even receive us. He just, he's all about him. That's all you get. Well, that's not very helpful. Or, or, or James and John in Matthew 20, when they go run into Jesus with mom, right? They're in a team. It's a group. You're the disciples. And yeah, but we're going to get some advantage here. Mom, talk to Jesus. Get us some jobs, you know. Get them to sign off on some jobs. That would be awesome. But it didn't happen. No signing off at all. So that didn't work. But that's not it. Jesus told them it didn't work like that in his kingdom. We're a team, a body, collectively. Look, there are a lot of people who attend church. By comparison, few of the people in church make an effort to serve. And even fewer are willing to pay the price to reach out with the gospel. Paul wanted to be sure that this church hung there together. Let's remain steadfast. Let's do this thing one with another. Because the world is out to get us, you know, in that regard. We're in a spiritual battle. So it's good to belong to a church where you can fight together and strive together, athletic terms, with athletics. Join the team, if you will. And that's so helpful. So... You know, here the world looks at us tonight, and they either see a group of people united in the good news, or they see a soap opera, where there's all kinds of, have you heard, have you talked to someone, did you hear, oh. 
and the world dies in their sin. Satan knows that, and so you will often find that, that his focus is upon dividing the church. You know, it seems to me that oftentimes people are pushed together in church simply because there are storms outside. They don't necessarily want unity, they just want to get out of the storm. And, and really, that's a better description of the Noah's Ark, you know? Noah's Ark was such that it was, if it wasn't for the deadly storm outside, you'd have never dealt with the stench inside. But you really couldn't leave. There was no place to go. Well, God wants more than escape or tolerance. He wants a body that is one spirit and one mind. Now, now you should know that biblically, one spirit and one mind doesn't mean we all say the same things and do things in the same way. That would just be boring. And God isn't interested in that. There's enough differences to keep things interesting. You know, whether you like stained glass, or you like wearing blue jeans, whether you like to swing from sandaliers or sing some sobering hymns, look, we're still one body. There's plenty of room for diversity, but when it comes to the issues that matter, how people need to get saved, and, and who Jesus is, and why he came, and his atonement, and the resurrection, you know, unless it's about essentials, the sword probably shouldn't be turned on ourselves. We should be striving together for the sake of the gospel. So Paul says to the church from death row, look, you need to have real consistency in your walk. Second of all, you need to hang on to the unity that God has brought you together in. You know, there's a tendency to battle each other that rather than battling for souls because I think we don't get out much. If you got out into the world much, you'd realize there's a bigger problem than the guy sitting in the pew with you. There's folks that are lost, right? And, and what we do is we'd rather fight somebody else because we're not very articulate in our faith and, or we don't see the battle much. I remember Martin Luther Jones, uh, in one of his sermons, talked about the, the psychology wards in Spain that they were overflowing right before the Spanish Civil War. But when the war broke out and it looked like everyone in Spain had to say to themselves, are we going to survive? Is our kids going to live through this? All of the psych wards emptied out. Because people all of a sudden had a more pressing problem, their own families. So here's my suggestion to you. If you're prone to meddling and gossiping and carrying one negative opinion from one person to the next, relentlessly judging other people, always analyzing and stuff, ministry methods and all, just get out more often. Go hang out at the world somewhere. Go watch what the world does. Because I think when you begin to battle for souls, all of that petty stuff will go away and you'll grow up, and you'll be wiser for it. By this shall all men know your disciple, if you love one another. That's what we read. So, look, Paul says to the church, you guys have to strive together, because there's way too many adversaries out there for you to fight on your own. So we can't have a divided church. Now, not everything in Philippi was perfect. I mean, if you read the whole book, and you have several times, I think, you know, by the time you get to chapter 4, Paul will actually name a couple of women who were in such disagreement in this little church that the church had divided into two camps. Some were on her side, some were on her side. And they were just, it was, it was undermining their witness and it was rubbing out the joy and, and Satan was having a field day. So Paul said, look, you've got to be consistent. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. And second of all, you have to find unity amongst yourself with one mind and you're striving together. You're, you're athletically committing to your part for the faith of the gospel. That's what we are all about. Thirdly, you'll need to be brave. Verse 28, Paul says, And not in any way should you be terrified by your adversaries, which to them is proof of their perdition, but to you of your salvation and that from God. Or, or if you will, don't let unbelievers intimidate or frighten you into silence. The word terrified speaks of a horse that shies away from a shadow or, or jumps out of the way when something unexpectedly startles him. Don't let the enemy alarm you. I can't begin to tell you how many Christians are running scared right now. But what do you got to be afraid of? We have the gospel, the good news. The world loves to turn on believers, and fear can manipulate you very well. But faith has to overcome. So Paul said, look, saints, you've got to be brave. I didn't say foolish. I said brave. Your undaunted courage in the face of challenging circumstances, your perseverance with one spirit and with one mind, your striving together in faith. Look, don't be frightened. Live out your heavenly citizenship publicly, no matter what the enemy might throw your way. And I'll tell you what, you are most 
um, effective. When your testimony is a steadfast joy in the Lord when the boat is rocking, when the way gets difficult, when a tax increase or costs rise, and yet you're standing fast, oh, I just have to trust the Lord. Stand up and go against the flow without fear. Because when you stand bravely, it's a proof of your salvation, while their continual opposition to the Lord and to his word is, is absolute proof of their lostness, if you will. They are just not going to be saved. They see a wonderful example of what God can do, and they still refuse. Remember the arrest in the garden when Jesus said to the men, maybe a thousand of them armed to the teeth, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. I'm he. Interesting. Or Stephen speaking to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7 and talking to them through the Old Testament of their failure to believe God's word. And as they picked up stones to kill him, he just kept talking until he died. And then he stopped talking. You know, Peter was a chicken on the night of Jesus' death. Oh, he talked a good game, but a little girl answering the door could chase him off. Or some guys on break. A few weeks later, filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter was bold. He, he preached it, man, didn't he? And 3,000 people came to know the Lord. Filled with the Spirit is necessary for this kind of bravery. And I'll tell you what, brave saints can make a world of difference. But I don't see too many brave saints. I don't mean crazy saints. You know, picketing with their signs somewhere, being lunatic and acting like it. I'm talking about people that are just convinced Jesus is the Lord, and they follow him. And they just don't bend. They love, but they don't bend. Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when the wicked encamp against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies, my foes? They're going to stumble. They're going to fall. That's great confidence, isn't it? Though an army of enemies encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though wars rise up against me, in this shall I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That's what I'll seek after. I might be in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord inquired in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he'll hide me in his pavilion the secret place of his tabernacle. He'll put me high upon a rock. Paul says to the church, man, you've got to toughen up. This isn't a game here, you know. This is life and death. What did Paul say to the, to the Romans there in chapter 8? What shall we say of these things? If God is for us, you finish it. Yeah, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? If God, it's God who justifies. So Paul says to these men and women, look, you've got to toughen up. You know, what a gift for us is this work of the Holy Spirit that gives us boldness and hope. You look at the disciples after Pentecost and see the power of God with the church. They were bold. Do you see a bold church today? Probably not. I'm not even talking activist church or political church. I think that's nonsense. God wants to save souls. Win your political agenda. You lose a soul. Did you win or lose? We need to win souls. Be consistent. Look for unity. Be brave. And here's the last word. Be ready to agonize. Verse 29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Now, we don't mind that first part. It's been granted to believe in him. I'll do that. But then we get to the second part, and to suffer for his sake. Oh, wait a minute. Look, you can't separate them. It's a package deal. One leads to the other's. Unfortunately, I don't think we always tell new believers the truth. We say to them, oh, you get saved, everything's going to be great. It's not so. Oh, it'll be great eternally. We tell them about a new life. We never mention the battle they're going to face. The word here for conflict is agon. What does that sound like? It's exactly right. It's agony, right? But notice this, the suffering for his sake is granted to you on his behalf. Now, unfortunately, the word granted is the word for privilege. 
so that it literally reads, it has been a privilege given to you on behalf of Jesus, not only that you can believe in him, but that you can suffer for him. It's a privilege. Now, I don't know anyone else or any place else in the world where suffering is a privilege, but it is in the Bible because it links you to the one you serve. It, it ties you in with the work he came to do. It makes you a co-laborer, if you will, with the Lord. Paul will say in chapter 3, verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection being made conformable to his death and entering into the fellowship of his suffering. I know it doesn't sound great, but hey, <laughs> it's a privilege that we are given by the Lord. Charizomai, it means to be graciously given as a favor. God gave you a favor. What? You can believe in me and find life great, and you can suffer for me. Favor. Suffering by itself is certainly no privilege. But if you suffer to accomplish the work of Jesus, Paul will say, and said he said it from verse 12 through 18, it's been worth it to me. The gospel is going out. The Roman guards are getting saved. The church is much more bold than it's ever been. Yahoo! And you read it and you go, are you nuts? No. I will rejoice in this. I continue to rejoice. And he even said to them, you should be rejoicing in this. You should be happy about this. You should be rejoicing with me. And everyone reads and goes, no. <laughs> this isn't good at all. This is where I get off the bus. Look, it has to be worth it to you to be able to enter into the work of God in some small way as a privilege despite the cost. You remember when the boys were arrested in Acts 5 before things really got to rolling too much and you, you read that they were, were told more than once they could no longer preach in, in the name of the Lord and they had disobeyed. And so they'd been arrested again. This time they took and just beat them. It was kind of like, we'll just leave them with a strong reminder that we mean business. And so they beat <laughs> these disciples. But then you read this in chapter 5, verse 40 of Acts. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them they should no longer speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So far, so good. But here's the next part of the verse. So they, the disciples, departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Why is it such a privilege? Because it brings you closer to Jesus, doesn't it? It, it, it causes you to see his sacrifice. It cleanses us as well. May the God of all grace and the eternal glory of Christ Jesus, after you've suffered for a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, comfort you. Look, it's, if you really want to be effective as a witness, you're going to suffer. It's going to be hard. Not always easy. People won't like you. Folks will turn against you. The job promotion may pass you by. Family may not listen. Doesn't really... You know, you, you can make a long list of difficulty. But if we're suffering on behalf of Jesus, there's a benefit. There's no benefit, by the way, for being obnoxious. Oh, I'm just suffering for Jesus. No, you're suffering for being an idiot. It's different. <laughs> suffering for being loud. You're suffering for being offensive. You're suffering for being pushy. Not any, none of that works for you, you know. But, but if you suffer on behalf of Christ, seriously for his sake, high honor. He suffered so I might live eternally. It seems to me it's a small thing that I would suffer a bit to get his word out so someone else might find Jesus. Is it worth it? <laughs> What's well, to Paul? When does it stop being worth it? For Paul, it was when he died and he could stand before the throne of God. But until then, I'm in. Why does God allow suffering for you? Why is he silent when we cry out for immediate deliverance? Why didn't he answer Jesus' call? My God, why have you forsaken me? Out of his agony came your life. And sometimes he wants to use your testimony through the fire to say to people, I know the Lord. Watch me live for him. So Paul says to them, look, don't let anybody put you off your game, if you will. You know, you stay with it because it's a proof that you're saved, your relationship with God. And it's a proof that they're not. But don't let them turn you away or, or frighten you. And be willing, if necessary, because of the privilege God has given you, to stand where Jesus has stood and to suffer in the world for his name's sake. Paul had been suffering tremendously for years. 
I mean, you, you know, I know we read it and we go home and watch TV, but he was in jail for three years for this, plus three years of his life. And he discounted the prison, he discounted the pain, he discounted the injustice, he discounted the persecution as nothing compared to what he had accomplished. He was fine with all of it. But the key was his outlook, right? No doubt Paul had memorized Jesus' words there in Matthew 5. You are blessed when you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You rejoice. You be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. That's the way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. you let that be a joy to you. Now, I, are you practicing that or am I just teaching that? That's hard, isn't it? See, it's that guy looking at you, the food inspector again. You, you, you're being watched. Now you've got to live up to it. It's hard to claim Jesus and then run for the hills. So, in heaven, the rewards will match the cost. Remember this. Wear the cross, wear the crown. Wear the cross, wear the crown. Paul said, no, Peter, in the first letter, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that are to try you, as though some strange happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you have become partakers in Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, yours will be with great exceeding joy. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's being blasphemed, but on your part, he's being glorified. Unity, consistency, unity, bravery, agony. That spells Cuba. <laughs> The only way I can remember stuff. Consistency, unity, bravery, agony. The Cuba means nothing. It's just there. <laughs> then Paul says this in verse 30. You are suffering or having the same conflict, if you will, which you've seen in me, now here to be with me, you're suffering the same thing. You know, Satan would like you to think tonight that your suffering is all alone. That no one's had it as bad as you. That no one's had to pay the price for standing up for Jesus that you've had to pay. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're not facing anything alone. Paul was facing it 800 miles away in Rome, but it was the same battle. And he says it to the church, look, just have a, a real attitude of trusting the Lord. Just look at me. I'm going through exactly what you're going through. I, I know it's not fair. I know what they're accusing you of. I, I'm the offended party. I, I have my rights. I'll fight it tooth and nail. And yet, sometimes the, the cost of being a witness can be great to you. It can be great. But the Philippians faced, noticed the same conflict, and he uses the same word, agony. The word conflict right there is the same word as before. The word agony. Agony. Paul had been facing it for years. Nothing new, guys. Only it's you this time, <laughs> not just me catching the flack. I know you read it and you want to say, well, that's easy for you to say, Paul. You're not facing what I am. No, I would suspect he's facing more. Well, I've lost my friends. I've been made fun of. I've been isolated. And Paul would say, let me tell you about suffering. So Paul says to these saints, look, you're facing what I am. What a privilege we've been given to serve Jesus. So let's live out our citizenship as Christians in the world that is watching in such a way that we bear much fruit and live joyfully through the circumstances, knowing that God has allowed them for his eternal purposes. And be privileged, be steadfast, strive together, be good citizens, prove you're saved, and move ahead bearing much fruit. We can make a difference. It's a pretty heavy message, don't you think? You don't really want more verses than that. These hurt plenty. <laughs> Father, tonight as we are sitting together, we thank you so much that you have brought us together to be a witness for you in this generation. Lord, we think back to how it was for those who knew you 30 or 40 years ago and how, how much easier it seemed to be to live for you in this culture. And yet today... We are almost like an off-scouring. People set us aside for the, the least little reason possible. They just don't want to hear it. And yet it is to that culture, to this generation, that you've called us to be your people. And we pray, Father, that our lives would consistently reflect 
your great love. That you would, Lord, make yourself known. That you would show us who you are. That you would have your way with us. That the world around us would see believers who are real and sincere. And they are consistent in their walks with you. Come good, come bad. God, you're, you're on the throne and, and you'll, you'll not be taken from it. May you bind us together more. May we pray for one another more. May we know each other better so we could be an encouragement one to another. May we do this together. And may you give us, Lord, a boldness and a bravery that only comes from your spirit. Even to the point that we are willing to agonize for the sake of a soul that is lost. Or for life that, that watches to see how we're going to handle the opposition. Will we act like the world and respond like the world? Or will we be otherworldly? <laughs> Citizens of a kingdom they know nothing about. Help us, Lord. Help us. And tonight I would encourage you, you know, as we're having communion, let's think about how we can live our lives before the Lord in such a way that they'll see Jesus. We'll be distinct. Our lives will shine. It's not going to always be easy. But consistency and unity go a long way to make us brave and willing to undergo the agony. We need to stand fast. The world doesn't know him. And like the woman at the well, we'll fight to hear about him. But underneath all that anger is, is, is hunger and hurt. And God has sent us to bring his word to those that are lost. If tonight you don't know the Lord, know that God is willing to give life to you tonight, to wash you of your sins, to make you new, to send his spirit, to live within your life so he can enable you to live for him. He'll do that tonight if you'll just ask him in. We're going to have communion. But Jesus gave communion to believers. It wasn't a religious experience. It was, a, it was an outward practice that assured them of his work and gave them great hope for the future. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, Jesus said, you show forth my death until I come again. If you don't know the Lord, right where you're sitting, you can say, Jesus, I, I'm sorry for my sins. I recognize I have them. I know I can't cover up for them or set a, make up for them with you. Since the wages of sin is death, thank you for loving me so much you sent Jesus. So he would take my penalty, my, my punishment. He would stand where I deserve to stand. And because of that, one day I'm going to stand before you forgiven and washed. Not by my good works, but because of his faithful work and his loving actions on my behalf. And if you'll just pray that prayer, God will hear and save your life. Eternally so. Wash you clean, make you new, and then give you of his spirit. And you'll be saved. And then after we dismiss tonight, you can come up and talk to one of the pastors. Say, I prayed to receive the Lord tonight. Now what? And let us give you some Bible studies to take home and begin to look up verses that God would just direct your life then to begin to grow in Him. As we worship tonight, some of our college kids and leaders are going to come and serve you. So let's hang on to the bread and the cup till everyone's served. Let's just spend some time thanking the Lord for His goodness. And then we'll have communion together.